the year of 2020, there were these two guys named Alexis and Kevin, and they designed an app. And the app was called Be Real. Anyone probably under the age of 20 might know what I'm talking about, an app called Be Real. Now, this app was designed in a way so that users were able to share their life in an unfiltered and unedited way. Now, this app was created to be a bit of a rival to Instagram, an app that is quite filtered and quite edited. And it was also made in a way to de-emphasize social media use or overuse. So, this is how the app worked. Once a day, randomly throughout the day, the app would alert its users that it was time to be real. And in a two-minute window, users had the opportunity to take a photo of themselves or whatever they were doing and upload it to the app in a two-minute window. And the trick was is that if you didn't upload, you didn't actually get to see what other people were posting or anything anyway. So no matter whether you were sitting at school in a class, maybe you were at work, maybe you were on the toilet, whatever it was, in that two-minute window, you had to take a photo and upload it to the app. And then for the next 24 hours, you'd be able to look at all the other different things that people were being real about um, until the next alert was sent. So the app grew in popularity. And in 2022, the app peaked at having 15 million users worldwide. It became number one on the App Store for a time. And in its peak, it was estimated to be worth 600 million US dollars. Jason Kobler, he was a writer for Vice Media, he said this, in contrast to Instagram, which presents an unattainable view of people's lives, Be Real instead makes everyone look extremely boring. It was a successful app based on the premise of you being real in response to society's lack of realness. But I wonder, how real was Be Real really? Who are you real with? Who are the people in your life who you are just 100% authentic with, if any? It might be your partner, it might be uh, your parents, it could be a sibling or a really close friend. Who are you 100% authentic with? I think if we're honest with ourselves, we very rarely are 100% authentic with the people who are around us. Most of us, we put up a bit of a front, a bit of a, um, a behavioural change when we're around other people. Some of us are conflict avoidant, and so we put up this front where we change our behaviour to keep the peace at all costs. You know, sometimes that's at the detriment to ourselves, sometimes that's even at the detriment to our morals and values as people. Others of us put up this really hard exterior. We pretend that the world cannot touch us. We speak in a way that's a bit uh, flippant and maybe without caution. We put up this hard exterior around us to pre pretend that we're something that we're not because likely inside we're feeling a bit insecure. Some of us display this picture-perfect image to the world. It's like social media, right? We, we display this image of our lives that looks like we're all put together, that everything's okay, everything's planned how it should be. But inside, we can feel broken and like our life is falling apart. Some of us are those ones where when we walk into the room, the energy changes, where we bring joy, we bring excitement. But again, for those people, some of us are feeling like we're battling things. We could be battling mental illness, battling um, addictions, battling relational hurts. We're keeping secrets or we're feeling shame. 
Does anyone really know you authentically? Who knows you best? Who are you the most real with? And since we're talking about being real, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Abby. I'm part of the team here at Lifeway. I'm so glad that you are with us this morning as we continue on in our series in the Summer Psalms. The last couple of weeks, we have been looking at different psalms. Some have been really encouraging, some have been challenging, probably a mix of both. But what the psalms does is it displays for us this way for us to be really real with God, to come before him authentically and honestly and to bear ourselves to him. And if you've missed any of the first couple of messages in our series, can I encourage you, go back and give them a watch on our YouTube channel because there's some great ones there. But our psalm today, and if the offering video didn't give it away, here it is. The psalm today is Psalm 139. And for time's sake today, we're not going to read through the whole thing because it's quite a large one. But I just want to give you an overall glimpse of what's in this psalm. Because the writer David, he really focuses in this psalm about God being all-knowing, ever-present, and all-powerful. But it's actually less about the knowledge of these things. But David writes in the way of how these things actually impact how he comes before God. Here's a few verses. We read from verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And verse 13, you might know this one pretty well. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast the sum of them. And then David goes on taking all of this information that, that he said, all of these um, attributes of God, that, he, that God knows him, that God is present with him, that God is powerful. And then David asks God to transform him. He asks like this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. These words, search me, test me, see in me, lead me. These are vulnerable prayers for us to pray, but they are ones that if we sincerely do pray them, God will do some amazing work in us. They are bold requests. They are a little bit scary, if we're honest, but the aftermath of what will likely be confronting and likely uh, we'll have some work to do, the aftermath of working through all those things, there can be so much fruit. So much fruit can come from being refined by God and he can transform our lives when we do that. Search me, test me, see in me, lead me. These are four vulnerable prayers and we're going to focus on those today. So what do you think it means for us to ask God to search us? Because we've already established earlier in this psalm, he already knows us. He knows our comings and our goings. He knows the words that we're going to speak before we even say them. We already have established all of these things. So why do we need to ask God to search our heart? Do you have a good heart? I think all of us would like to think that we have good hearts, right? You go, well, I'm a kind person, I'm generous, I'm nice to other people, I want the best for other people, I've got a good heart. But the Bible says this in Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart 
is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Ouch. But that's the truth. That without Christ, we do not have a good heart. We lie, we cheat, we steal, we lust, we complain, we gossip. Even when we try our best, even when we think our heart is good, it's just not. Our heart is still deceitful. That is why we need Christ. Not just to forgive us, but to transform our hearts. This last week, uh, I was honoured to be invited to speak at a youth camp over the last couple of days in Williamstown. And as part of this camp, we were looking at the topic of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to give your whole life to him, to dedicate your whole life to him? And we talked about the difference between being a follower of Jesus and simply just being an admirer of Jesus. Because we can think of admirers being like this. Admirers look at Jesus and they might think, hey, Jesus is pretty cool. I like some of the things that he says. I like some of the things that he asks us to do, but I'm only going to take on the bits that are convenient and comfortable for me to do so. That's admirers of Jesus. It's like this. My husband, Rob, and I, we uh, are going to be celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. I don't know. Fit. Um, He's put up with me for that long. Bless him. Uh, But if 10 years ago, I took on his name, I changed my last name to be the same as his name so that I could identify myself as part of his family. But if that was the only part that changed, if we didn't then live together, if we didn't join our finances together, if we didn't start a family together, if we didn't actually change anything other than the name, that'd be a bit weird, right? But that's what some people do. We're happy to take on the name of Christian. We're happy to take on the name of believer, but then nothing else really changes. And that's what we might consider an admirer of Jesus. And of these type of people, God says this, these people come near to me with their mouth and they honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The deceitful hearts, the desperately wicked hearts. So a prayer like this one we're talking about, search me God, That's a little bit scary if you're not actually planning to confront what comes up. Because this prayer has the potential to convict you, it has the potential to correct you, and it has the potential to change your life if you allow God to do it. You know, David, the writer of this psalm, at the very start of his uh, story that we read in the Bible, we can read it in 1 Samuel, we see that the prophet Samuel had been given a task to do. He was going to anoint the next king. And so Samuel's turned up and he's looking at the people who he might, might be the king. And God says to him, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And God chose David. God chose David based on his heart. And there was heaps of times that we read where David got it wrong, right? So many dumb mistakes that David made. But at his heart... David wanted to please God, and it's from that same heart that he wrote this psalm. So what might happen if you pray this prayer, search my heart? Well, in my experience, 
God will put before you some hard truths. He will illuminate places in your heart that are actually far from his heart. You'll be faced with your sinfulness. You'll be faced with your brokenness. And you'll be faced with your need for forgiveness. And I want to believe that us as people who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that we would continue to want to be refining our heart to be more like Jesus' heart. That we won't settle for being this one foot in, one foot out type of Christians. We can't have one foot in and one foot out when it comes to our faith. So dealing with our deceitful heart is, import, is an important part of truly living for God and truly following in his ways. Unfortunately, this prayer alone is not the cure. We can't just pray, search me God, and expect everything to be better. It's not an all of a sudden thing. But in facing the reality of our sinfulness, we become more aware of our need for a saviour. And then we can rest and draw close to Jesus, make choices that reflect more of his heart. And through that process, our heart can be transformed to look more like Jesus in the process. Search me and know my heart. And the second prayer, test me and know my anxious thoughts. I wonder what is it that makes you anxious or stressed or nervous? What is it that keeps you up at night, those thoughts that you keep mulling over? It might be the fear of losing your job. It might be that question of how am I going to pay the bills this month? It might be a fear of, whether one day you might get married or a fear of you being stuck in a marriage that's not good at the moment. Maybe it's anxiety around whether you might have children one day or maybe as parents we're looking at our children going, how do we do this? And that brings up anxiety. Maybe it's health things, stress around your own health or the health of someone around you. What are you most afraid of? What fears alter the way that you live your life? You know, as part of preparing this message, I had to get real with myself too. I had to ask this question of myself. And I came up with this. I have a fear of failing. I have a fear that if I let any balls drop, if I let anyone down, I am a failure. And I see this in a lot of different ways in my life. I need to tick things off lists. I need to I feel productive. And this contributes to how I perceive my worth. People being happy with me, people being happy with what I'm doing, I, I equate that to my worth. And I don't want to fail <laughs> So therefore, it's made me trigger shy. It stops me from stepping into places that are uncomfortable. If I can't be sure that I can control it, I'm more hesitant to step in those, those places because I don't want to fail. And I don't want others to think of me as a failure. You know, my dad tells this story of me. I was five years old and a couple of days out from going to my first day of prep. And I remember... Uh, he, him telling me that I was so anxious and so scared about going to school because I didn't know how to read, and I didn't know how to write, and I didn't know how to do math. And what I failed to understand as a five-year-old is, like, that's what you go to school for. But this trend has followed me throughout my life. And I, I think then I have... Uh, gone through this journey of trying to find out as much about myself so that I can get on the front foot. You know, I've done this journey of self-development and improvement, so I've learnt myself, learnt about myself through personality tests, 
I've done leadership training. I've sought mentors. All of this just to try and keep control. What I failed to understand was that this is a normal part of living life. Failure is normal and failure is okay. I don't always have control over things. And I, what I realized was that in my attempt to hold it all together, I was seeking after a control that wasn't mine to have. That in seeking control, I wasn't seeking God. But the thing that I feared most was the thing that I was trusting God with the least. And maybe that is true for you too. What do you fear? And are you trusting God with it? You know that saying, let go and let God? It irks me a little bit. (laughs) It's a bit lame. But there is truth in it. Because sometimes the things that we have tight grasps on are the things that we have to let go of and hand to him. You know, we're not really sure about what things David was anxious about. But hey, could have been a range of things. Could have been uh, death. Could have been uh, doing the right thing as a king. Trusting God when things were falling apart. That's what he did. He, he came and said this prayer. He was asking God to reveal in him the things that are his greatest fears identifying the fears so that he could then trust them back up to God, knowing that God is greater than any fear that he could have. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. If this prayer didn't seem pretty gutsy already, it's about to get even more gutsy. David is asking God to uncover his sins. Anything that he does, anything that he says, anything in his thought life that is not of God, David wanted him to bring it out. And the thing is, is that each of us are kind of masters of rationalizing and reasoning away our actions, even when we are wrong. You know, sometimes because of our deceitful heart, it's hard to see the things that we do that might displease God. We make excuses. We say, at least my sin's not as bad as that person's sin. We reason them away. It's easier to see the speck in someone else's eye than the plank in your own eye. (laughs) Again, We know that David made dumb decisions and he didn't always stick to God's best for him. And that's a bit like us. He probably got really good at reasoning and rationalizing away his actions, even when David knew that these actions were wrong. But denying the truth doesn't deny the facts. It doesn't change the facts. Denying the truth doesn't change the facts that sinning is sinning and God doesn't like sinning. No matter how much we try and rationalize it, sin is not okay with God. And so he prayed this prayer that God would continue to refine him. David desperately wanted to please God. And it goes back to that question. Are we going to be followers of Jesus? Or are we merely going to settle for being just admirers of him? When we pray this vulnerable vulnerable prayer of asking God to illuminate our sins, we need to be ready to deal with them. We need to be ready to put in the work to correct them. But we don't do it alone. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the prayer that I find comfort in. 
That after I've prayed, search me, test me, see in me, when I'm sitting in the realness of my fears and my pride and my sinful humanity, that I can call on God and he will guide me through it all. Because even in my mess, even in my brokenness, even in my confusion, in my weakness, God will make a way. Because when I am weak, he is strong. Because when I am hurting, he provides comfort. Because when I am tempted by sin, his grace is available to me and his spirit can lead me on a different path. Because when I am fearful and anxious, his peace is available to me. God says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When my deceitful heart leads me astray, as long as I humble myself before him, he will lift me up. He will lead me on his best path, the everlasting path. And it is through God's power that our hearts and our lives can be transformed. But we actually need to ask God to do that work in us. In a later psalm, in, uh, David writes, Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. And teach me to do your will, for you are my God. When we give our lives to God and submit under his leadership and his authority, God will guide us. And he does that in a few ways. He has given us his word, our Bibles, which is full of guidance and encouragement and direction for living. Open them up, read them. He has given us communities to gather together to help keep ourselves accountable, to share our struggles with each other so that we don't face these things alone. He has created us in a way that has a conscience and he has gifted us with his spirit so that we can discern the right path that leads us to a life more like Jesus. And it's important for us to be reminded that God lavishes his grace upon us. He knows that we won't always get it right. He knows that sometimes we will go off the path. But admirers of Jesus tolerate sin, but God does not. And true followers of Jesus will strive to remove the temptation of sin by seeking God's strength seeking God's guidance, seeking God's power so that he can lead us towards the best path. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We have a choice. We can settle for being admirers of Jesus and just take the parts that are comfortable and convenient for us. Or we can devote our whole lives to Him, our whole lives, our heart, our soul, everything to Jesus and to walking in His ways. We can take seriously the call on our life that God has intended for us to draw close to Him, to pursue relationship with Him, to live in the fullness of God. Or we don't. And we miss out on the ultimate life that God has for each of us. But God doesn't want us to have a one foot in, one foot out type of faith. God wants us all in. Are you all in? Are you surrendering your whole life 
to Jesus or are you settling for being an admirer, just taking the parts that suit you? So if we choose to pray this prayer that David David did from Psalm 139, we need to do so expecting that God will deliver. He will shine His light into the dark places of your heart. He will make real to you the parts that He wants to refine off your character. God will speak in the conviction of our hearts. He will put people in our lives who will speak wisdom and truth into our situations. And He will redirect you if you read Scripture. And hey, it is not always fun to come face to face with your sin. He may show you things that you're not very proud of, but He loves you too much to let you be stuck there. But there is so much grace, so much grace. The Lord said to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. God's grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul says, I will boast gladly about my weakness because Christ's power rests on me. If you are stuck in sin, if you are feeling so deep in it that you can hardly see a way out, if you are feeling weak, continually continually coming against your life, God is saying, it's in my power that there will be breakthrough. Breakthrough of addictions, breakthrough of when our thoughts spiral, breakthrough of the lies that we tell ourselves, breakthrough of difficult relationships, breakthrough of bad attitudes, breakthrough of pride and self-preservation, anything in your life that is not of God, God can break through if you call on Him and allow Him to. Seek God, draw near to Him, humble yourself before Him, be real with Him. And then listen for his leading and allow God to transform your life. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. But just know whatever God brings up for you, you are not alone. If you need to reach out to one of the partial team, we'd be more than happy to go through this with you. Ask for support amongst your people, amongst your life groups. You do not have to do this alone. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Are you ready to pray a vulnerable prayer? just as David did. Are you ready to humble yourselves before God and be open to his leading? Are you ready to be pulled out of your complacency and your comfort and go through the refining process to be more like Jesus? It is not easy, but God never promised easy. However, living in the fullness of what God has for you in his perfect plans for you, in living in obedience and truth, He will bring joy. He will bring peace. He will bring comfort into our lives as we continue to grow deeper and deeper in our relationship with Him. So may I invite you to stand for a moment. And if you'd like to pray this prayer with me, perhaps you might just open your hands up as you pray. Father God, We thank you that you are an all-knowing, all-powerful, always present in our lives, God. You know us so deeply, even the parts that we attempt to hide from you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. 
Thank you that you show mercy towards us even when we don't deserve it. Thank you for your generous, generous grace, God. And God, today we humbly come before you and ask maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, will you please, God, search us. Illuminate every part of our hearts so that nothing is hidden from you. Test us on the things that we're anxious about, the things that we haven't surrendered over to you, Lord. Help us release our grip on those things that we find hard to give over to you. Lord, our finances, our children, our relationships, our hopes, our own dreams, Lord. God, help us lay them down at your feet. Lord, you see the sin in our lives. Nothing we do is hidden for you. But we don't want to be caught up in sin, God. We strive to be more like Jesus every day. Please, God, help us not to get away with the sin in our lives any longer. That through your power, we will overcome the chains of sin in our lives. Lord, we understand that nothing that we have done and nothing that we can do will ever separate us from your love and from your grace. Lord, we seek your forgiveness. And God, by your spirit, would you please lead us as we continue to strive to be more like Jesus. Create a hunger within us to seek you intentionally through your word, through the encouragement of the fellowship that you have us a part of. May you continue to lead us. And Lord God, may this prayer be one that we are continually bold enough to pray so that we don't become complacent, that we would always be opening to your refining God. Lord, we love you. May you have your way in us. Not our will, but your will be done, God.